Welcome to our Sunday night uh, Bible study, our Life Point Online, and I hope you're encouraged from tonight's message. We are in Psalm 34. Psalm 34. Next week, we will begin a study in 2 Corinthians. It was some years ago we worked through the book of 1 Corinthians, and so now I thought it would be a good time to begin 2 Corinthians, and I know you'll enjoy that study, and hopefully you'll be able to follow along with us. But Psalm 34 in your Bibles, I struggled with a title for this psalm, uh, mainly because it, it ties in a lot with, at least in this sense, with last week, in that it's also an alphabet psalm. And so each letter of the alphabet is used in sort of an acrostic style uh, to kind of help understand uh, what David wanted to get out. Psalm 34 is a David looking back on what God did uh, when he was there before Achish, uh, the king of the Philistines, the king of Gath, and he made himself into a madman. And, you know, the, the drool was coming down of his beard. He started scratching at uh, the doors uh, so that he could escape because he realized he made a really bad choice in going to Gath. And so I wanted uh, to try to steer clear of, you know, the alphabet part of it. Um, but I couldn't keep myself from thinking about the word hindsight. And the reason I wanted to stay away from it is, uh, you know, the saying is hindsight's always twenty twenty. And I wanted to stay as far away from 2020 as possible, as I'm sure everyone could uh, feel the same way. Uh, they wish 2020 was just completely skipped. And we'd go right to 2021, like 2020 never happened. Uh, but I want to talk about this from Psalm 34. Uh, looking back to look ahead. How when we look back on what God has done, how it helps us to have a clearer understanding of what we should do moving forward, uh, which we have to be careful because the Bible tells us not to, to look back. But this is an instance in which looking back is good. And you'll understand why as we work through this psalm. So Psalm 34, let's talk first of all about looking back. And of course, looking back is very personal because it's about David's life. When he looks ahead, he'll make it very practical for not only himself, but anyone who would listen to, uh, read, or of course sing this psalm. But let's talk about the looking back first, the personal uh, things that David wants to speak about when it comes to what happened at Gath and what God did. So first, uh, David said, uh, before we get into any of the actual details, and by the way, he doesn't jump into too many of them. He says, but before we get into anything, he says, I'm going to take this moment right now and celebrate. I want to praise God for just a moment. And that's what he does in the first three verses. Look at it. He says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Three things I believe David is aiming for in this celebration and reminding himself of what God has done and celebrating what God has done, making, it, making a big deal of God and his blessings to David. First of all, David says, listen, I want my celebration, my praise to be consistent. Notice what he, he says in verse 1. He says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be on my lips. So I want there to be consistency in my praise to God. I don't want to go through life having uh, to... Uh, Think back and not being able to remember periods of time where I didn't praise God. You know, Spurgeon once said he can't think 
over for a 40 year period of his life looking back he says I can't remember 15 minutes uh, where I didn't think about Jesus now, how convicting it's that and David here says something very convicting as well he says listen what, what I want to always be on my mouth the things that I'm speaking I want it to be praise to God but not only consistency I also see that he wants this to be an encouragement because notice how what he says in verse 2. He says, my soul shall make her boast. And that's really where that idea of celebration comes from. And I, I just want to brag on God for a moment. But then he says this, the humble shall hear thereof. Shall hear what? His praise. He says, man, the humble are going to hear thereof and be glad. And so here's David and here's what he's getting at. He's like, man, I want people that, we're in that same position that I was in. Uh, that idea of humble is really you know, downtrodden, needy, desperate for, for God to intervene, uh, that they've been afflicted and they need something to happen. And David said, man, if my praise of what God did for me in, in my moment of need uh, can be an encouragement to somebody else, he said, man, that's even another reason uh, that I should praise God. And then lastly, I think that uh, what David is aiming for in his celebration is that he wants, he wants to be contagious. And, and you understand this as well. There's something even about praising, worshiping God in a celebratory manner of what God has done uh, that man, it just makes other people that have experienced the same thing or are experiencing uh, God's deliverance, man, they want to join in. Notice what he says, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Man, there is something about a group of people that when they get together, they can't help but just magnifying God. It's contagious. And that's what David wanted. He said, man, listen, if, if me beginning to praise God in this moment can excite some other people that will hear, uh, that will read, or that will uh, probably sing this psalm, man, if it will cause other people to praise God as well, then man, I want people to know that what God has done in their life is worth celebrating. By the way, this is mutually beneficial. It's beneficial to the downtrodden person, the one who needs to hear it. But it's also beneficial to David to know that his life and what God has done is making an impact and changing uh, people's perspective and, and challenging people to celebrate the goodness of God in their own life or to praise God with them, to magnify God with them. Man, it is mutually beneficial when we do this. But not only does David want to celebrate, but in verses 4 through 6, I believe David actually begins uh, that time where he wants to remember. Remember what God has done for him. Look at it. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto him and were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, David talking to himself, and the Lord heard him. And saved him out of all his troubles. Can you imagine as David was drooling and, and slobbers coming down his beard and he's scratching on the door uh, of, uh, of the castle or wherever he was at. And making a fool of himself, pretending to have gone insane. Could you imagine that under his breath, his thoughts were, God, would you save me? God, I don't know what I've gotten myself into, but I know uh, I cannot do anything in this one. I need you to intervene. I need you to come to my rescue. And notice the simplicity of what David remembers at this moment. Think about the, 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 the words that he uses in these verses. He said, I sought, God heard, God delivered. And, and then he says, I cried. God heard, God saved. I don't think David is trying to shortchange God by 
neglecting the nitty gritty details of everything that actually happened. What I think David is actually do, doing is he re removing any, any part about the story that could possibly make him look good and steal any of the glory from God. So he doesn't even talk about the things that he did that could have caused someone to think that David had a part in his salvation. He said, no, this, this was entirely God. And we sing the song, count your blessings, name them one by one. And when we do, what happens? We will be surprised what the Lord has done. When was the last time you counted your blessings? You know, this praise is a response of remembering God's work in his life. Remembering is a choice. Think about it. it. It is a choice. Yeah, there might be times and places in your life where it comes up out of nowhere, we could say. You know, something sparks that uh, memory and you begin to contemplate and think about that and, you know, reminisce a little bit. But overall, remembering is a choice, which means praise is also a choice. Because you choose what you remember, and therefore you're choosing what you will praise. He moves on from this remember, and then he wants to explain things a little bit, because he, he doesn't want to shortchange God. He starts with the, the simple fact that God, he cried, God heard, God saved. He prayed, God heard, God delivered. But David doesn't want to neglect to actually explain how he felt this all actually happened. So look at verses 7 through 10. It says, The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him, and delivereth them. O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. O fear the Lord, ye his saints. For there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. So he noticed, notice how he begins to explain how he feels all of this happened. He said, first of all, God camped around me. Or we could say he placed a garrison. God was keeping watch over me, David said. And, and not just God in any sense. He says, the angel of the Lord encamped around me. You might be wondering, well, who is this angel of the Lord that is in question here? Judges 2 and verse 1 says, An angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Boshem and said, I made you to go up out of Egypt and have brought you unto the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Uh, of course. Uh, you can even look at Judges chapter 6 or Judges chapter 13. Similar stories when an angel of the Lord appeared. Genesis chapter 32 verses 1 and 2. Jacob says something like this. And Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's host. And he called the name of that place Mahanaim, which means uh, two uh, tents. So uh, Jacob was like, oh, I I've camped here. But what I've just realized is that God also camped here while I was camping here. His angels were watching over me, but not just any angel. The angel of the Lord. We would call this a Christophany, an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ. And David said, listen... I, I feel safe, I feel protected, and I know that I will be delivered because God, Jesus Christ, has camped around me. And what does this provide? What does this do for the believer? David said, because of this, blessed is the man that trusteth in him, and really that means the one who takes refuge in him. Here's God, he's camping around us. And Dave said, I'm already in the center of that because God is encamped round about me. He says, I'm going to trust in that, not in my own schemes, not in my own plans. I'm going to trust that the God who camps around me is going to protect me. But then notice he adds to it. He says this, Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints. 
For there is no want to them that fear him. So first of all, fearing God equals lacking nothing. Then he says this, the young lions do lack and suffer hunger. So fearing God equals lacking nothing. Young lions equals lack and hunger. And then he says this, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. So seeking God, he says, is wanting no good thing. So the only question here, at least to me, is that part in the middle, what's, what's the young lions all about? Well, a young lion would be the one who has the strength, the stamina to, to, to take what he wants, to, to provide for himself. He doesn't need uh, because he can figure it all out on his own. So David's saying, hey, be careful if you think that you're strong enough to handle everything on your own, that you think you've got it all covered, that you're, you're a tough guy and, and nothing can keep you from what it is that you want. If, if there's a problem, you can solve it. If there's a struggle, you'll get through it. If, if there's a need, you'll provide it. He said, no, I'm going to just trust in God. So think about fearing God equals lacking nothing. Seeking God equals wanting no good thing, according to David here, which means to fear God is to seek God. And to seek him is to fear him. So David's just explaining, you know, you'd be very wise to fear God. And if you fear God, then you would seek him. And then he ends it with this confidence. Well, he doesn't really end it. It's really if you were to summarize verses 1 through 10, you'd say David comes to the point of confidence. Think about it this way. When we, we, when we begin with praising God as he did in verses 1 through 3, we will end at a point where we're confident in God because that's where he ended in 7 through 10. I can trust in God. I can place my confidence in him. I can take refuge in him knowing that he will deliver me. Now, how often does, at least for you, for, for me, it's true. I don't know how often it is for you, but hopefully it's true. I mean, when we gather as a church and we're here in the building together, and we're singing praises to God collectively. How often is it when you're praising God, you're listening to the words, you're hearing them, and they just start to ring true in your own heart and mind? And you're overwhelmed with this feeling of, yeah, that is so true. God is so good. Uh, God, God does care. I, I always get that feeling. It's why it's my favorite song. When, when we sing Grace Greater Than Our Sin, uh, when we get uh, to the course, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that can pardon and cleanse within, I always get that feeling. I listen to everybody else sing and, and that collective praise that, that, hey, would you magnify God with me? Man, it just reassures me of the confidence that I have in what Christ has done. By the way, this provides at least to me a benefic beneficial reverse truth. If our praise results in confidence, then our lack of confidence can probably be traced back to a lack of praise. So I wonder, how often are you praising? Praising God for what he's done, that you're looking back and you're forcing yourself to remember times and places where God really showed up for you, where God really provided. I don't have to look too far back. I was thinking about it often, even, even this week, I've been thinking about it often through this quarantine, uh, that you know, since we've moved to Michigan, since my family came here to Michigan, uh, we have been uh, in no permanent dwelling place. And yet all along the, the, the six years here, this journey that we've been going through with you, God has not failed to put a roof over our head to provide us a place to stay because God has delivered us each and every time in many different ways. In each and every one, we are eternally grateful for how God has worked and we praise God for it. It's not something that we could have done and we could have worked out God worked, God moved, God provided, and we thank God for it. But then the rest of Psalm 34 is that looking ahead part. 
And it's very practical. He moves from, hey, listen, this is what God did for me to, to move it into what we might call the teacher mode. Okay, now what, what should this do for you? Because God did all of this for me, because God worked in my life in this way, now how should you respond to these truths? Notice, he says in verse 11, Come ye children, hearken unto me, I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Because let's remember what he just talked about. To fear God is to seek Him. To seek Him is to fear Him. So he says, listen, let me teach you the fear of the Lord. And really, if you think about what he ends up doing is teaching you how to seek a God. So notice, he starts off by asking a question about, you know, hey, you want to know what the keys are to a good, long life? By the way, those keys are fearing God because you're seeking Him. Notice what he says. What man is he that desireth life and loveth many days that he may see good? It's an obvious question. Everybody would answer in the affirmative. Yeah, I want, a, I want a long, good, happy life. So he says this, keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. So basically just three things he says that we should do. And by the way, this is not an exhaustive list of do's and don'ts uh, when it comes to the Christian life but it is a good foundational starter kit or pack for those who want to fear God and seek Him. So he says, guard your words, which in essence we would know by studying other passages in the Bible, what David is really saying is not just guard your words, but you have to guard your heart because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. This is a guard your words. Watch what you say. You know, be, be, be pure and honest in the words that you speak. Not only that, he basically says, listen, change your goals. Ch change the aim of your life, the pursuit of your life. He, he says, depart from evil and do good. Yeah, that's a conscious choice. Figure out what is the end goal of the decisions that, you've, that you're making, uh, of, of the, uh, the, the, the way you're progressing in life. Where is it leading you? What is it going to result in? And if it's evil, turn and go and find something good to do. Do good, not evil. Do things that will please God. And then he says this, pursue peace. Pursue after peace, which by the way, Peter references this very part of Psalm 34 in 1 Peter 3, 10 through 12, where he goes and uses not just uh, these three verses, but he uses the next three verses uh, as well, where it says, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. Peter said it this way, because the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. So, so why should you and I listen to David's counsel on fearing God on what does it mean to fear God and being taught what the fear of God is all about and his thought being hey listen you need to guard your mouth and uh, you need to change your goals and do good and you need to pursue peace okay well that's all well and good but uh, David really what does that have to do with fearing God and uh, not only well, what does that uh, have to do with uh, being beneficial to my own personal life well David tells us and Peter clarifies it because God is watching. That's why. Because God sees everything. And so it's David saying, if you truly fear God, if you are seeking God, then you will care about what God sees and hears from your life. Because notice what he says. His eyes are over the righteous, his ears are attentive unto their cry. So God is attentive to those that fear him and seek him. And he is ready and willing to respond. They said, well, wouldn't, wouldn't you want to live in such a way that the God who is real and can do things wouldn't you want to live in such a way where he would want to intervene in your life? Uh, that, that you know that he's going to hear you because his face is towards you, because his, his eyes are watching you, because you're living a righteous life? But not only that, he adds to it, not only does God see and hear, he says, listen, God is near. 
God is near us. The Lord, in verse 18 and 20, says, The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such that be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Isn't that tough to hear? David here saying, let me teach you the fear of the Lord. Hey, uh, do these things. He says, but by the way, hey, there's, there's many afflictions that are going to come with this. Let me forewarn you. If you're going to seek after God, there's going to be problems along the road. And then he says this, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. He keepeth all his bones and none of them is broken. What is this broken and contrite heart that David speaks of here, though? As if the Lord is really near, and he's near these broken and contrite people. Psalm 51 tells us the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, that will not despise. And so is it in regards to sin, when we are really broken over our sin, that's when we know that God is near? Or maybe Psalm 69 and verse 20, reproach hath broken my heart and I'm full of heaviness and I looked for some to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. Or maybe it's just the personal struggles of life. Those circumstances that just overwhelm us where we need someone to actually care that God is near. I believe that's more what David is getting at here. But how can you and I be sure that God cares and that God is near, that he hears and that he sees and that he's willing and ready to respond to us? How do we know that God cares this much about our circumstances, about what we're going through? How do we know? Well, it's that one statement that last verse, verse 20, he keepeth all his bones and none of them is broken. You and I would know that this is a, a prophetic verse about Jesus Christ. As he's on the cross, none of his bones would be broken. And here's what David is getting at. You know how, God, how you can know that God cares, that God is there through your deepest darkest pains, those moments of your greatest agony. He's near you. He hears you. He sees you. You want to know how you can trust it? Because he went through it himself and he says, I'm there for you. Then it ends with another bit of confidence. Look at verses 21 and 22 and we'll be done. Evil shall slay the wicked, and they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. The Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants, and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. Here he ends with, why can we take such great confidence in what Christ has done, what God is promising to us? Why is this such a satisfactory feeling that should cause us to fear God, to seek him, to want to guard our mouth and change our, our ways uh, and seek peace. What, why? Why is this so life-changing? Well, because David says, listen, the end of life we know is one of two things, condemnation or justification. Hey, the evil will be condemned forever and the righteous will be justified forever. Or as Romans 5 and verse 1 says, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I wonder, are you seeking God? Are you pursuing Him with your life? And, and as you're going through the struggles and the difficulties, the circumstances that bring affliction, and there are many, have you ever taken a moment and just looked back for just, just a brief moment and contemplated what God did and praising God for it? To, to those who are around you. By the way, I believe this is why God told the Israelites, listen, talk about what God has done. Uh, talk about it while you're, while, while you're sitting down. Talk about when you rise up. Talk about it at the dinner table. Talk about when you're out walking around with your friends. Every chance you get, talk about what God has done. 
because it's infectious, it's contagious. And it changes people's lives. It changes their perspectives. It gives us more reason to seek God and to fear Him. Won't you fear God, my friend? Would you seek after Him? I know you won't regret it. And I know if you take a moment and praise God, others will be encouraged. I hope this was an encouragement to you as well. And I look forward to talking to you again next week. If God were to invite you to have a conversation, in order for you to ask your questions, maybe even air your grievances, would you take God up on that invitation? Would you be willing to investigate the claims that he offers? Would you come into the conversation with an open mind would you be willing to believe? My friend, God has done just that. In Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18, the Bible tells us that come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. You see, God has invited you into a conversation where he's not afraid of the questions that you have, of the doubts that you will raise, he invites you actually to reason with him. And now listen, you know all the things that you might ask him. But can I tell you about the things that God would want you to know if you were to sit down and have this conversation with him? The things that he would want to tell you. First of all, can I tell you that God would want you to know that he loves you. Well, we know he loves us because he deals with as God, he deals with our biggest problem. And our biggest problem is that we've sinned, and because we've sinned, we will die. The Bible tells us for the wages of sin is death. You see, the very reason that you and I will die is because we've done wrong. We've, we've violated God's commands. We have done things that are against his righteousness. See, God is perfect, God is holy, God is just, and that's the way he created all things. He created them perfect. He said that after he created all things that they were good, that they were very good after he created man. But see, man sinned. And because we've sinned, uh, we cause there to be a separation between us and God that relationship that God desires for us to have with him, sin has broken. And see, the Bible tells us that because we sin, we die. There's none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. See, we're all sinners. And you and I should know that we are sinners because we are going to die. We can't argue that fact. You know, I know that one day we will all die. And because we're gonna die, we know we're sinners. But the good news about the love of God is that he deals with this issue. He deals with the issue of sin. He deals with the issue of death. See, the Bible tells us in John 3, 16, that famous verse that you probably yourself even know, it tells us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Hey, it deals with the death issue. And we know that if he deals with the death, death issue, he must have dealt with the sin issue. So, so how does he deal with that sin issue that we all have? Well, the Bible also tells us uh, that God commendeth or he demonstrated his love toward us. In that while we, you and I, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so his death dealt with our problem. See, when the Bible tells that God 
loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son, the way in which he gave him is he gave him in order that he might die. That's how much God loves you. That's how much God loves me. He loves us so much that he gave his son to die in our place. To pay the debt that you and I owe for our sins. He dealt with it. That's how much God loves you. But the good news is even more than that. So Jesus himself died and he rose again from the dead, which helps us to realize that he has power over death because death could not hold him. He died for our sins, but he also rose again. And in this whole process that we call the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, by the way, the gospel just means good news. And it is good news for you and for me that Christ did this, that he died for us, that he rose again three days later for us. It is good news. The Bible goes on to say that if we would just believe, that if we would confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in our heart that God hath raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. For with the heart, for the heart, excuse me, man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Uh, for whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I wonder, would you believe? This is what God says to you as you reason with him and his word. He says, I love you. And I love you so much that I was willing to send my son to die for you. And you don't have to do anything to earn this. You don't have to do anything to deserve it. It is as free to me as it is to you. Uh, for by grace are ye saved through faith. Not, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. God's not asking for you to earn it or to deserve his love. He says, I freely give it in Jesus. Would you believe the good news today? Would you believe that Jesus has done everything for you? Would you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he is your Lord? Would you believe in your heart that he's alive today, that he died for your sins? and that he offers you his righteousness so that your relationship with God can be restored. If you believe in this message from God to you, would you take a moment and would you reach out to us? We wanna help you in your Christian life. We wanna help you to know what it is that you're truly believing. We wanna help you to know Jesus more. So reach out to us. We love to be able to talk to you and help you and encourage you in these days.